How many hats does Satan actually wear? Is Satan in the Garden of Eden and loses his legs in Genesis 3.14? Is Satan a fallen angel in Genesis 6.4? Is Satan the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14.12? Is Satan the one who exalts himself in Daniel 11.36? Is Satan the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4? Is Satan cast out of heaven when he fights Michael in Revelation 12 and 7? The only verse that actually uses the term Satan is in Revelation chapter 12. So the rest of these can be explained in other ways, but Satan's name is not mentioned in any of these other verses. So what about this verse? Ezekiel 28, 14. Is this verse about Satan or the king of Tyre? So before we get to it, we're going to build up some background information to show you why it's not about Satan and why it is clearly about the king of Tyre. Israel respected kings of Tyre and vice versa. 2 Samuel 5 and 11. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons. And they built David a house. First Kings 9:11. Hiram the king of Tyre had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress and gold as much as he desired. That King Solomon then gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. So we see a relationship between the king of Tyre and David and Solomon because they used his resources for building in Israel. And we're going to see why that's important and what type of city Tyre actually was. The crowning city. Nehemiah 13, 16. Men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Isaiah 23 and 8. Who has taken this counsel against Tyre? The crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traders are the honorable of the earth. This is very important, speaking about Tyre being called a city of merchants, a crowning city, whose traders are the honorable of the earth. This concept of them being traitors is going to be very important. Behold, I am against you, O Tyre. Ezekiel 26, 1-4. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken who is the gateway of the peoples. Now she is turned over to me. I shall be filled. She is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Altair, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes waves to come, to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will scrape her from, I will scrape her dust from her and I will make her like the top of a rock. So we see that the relationship changed. Tyre <laughs> seemed to be happy that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and basically take advantage of that, right? I shall be filled, she is laid waste. But the Most High says, I'm going to call nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. We're going to see why the sea is important when we're talking about Tyre. And um, it's going to be very clear what is going on with the city of Tyre 
and its king. And we're going to see if we can stick Satan in the middle of this or not. I am perfect in beauty, Ezekiel 27, 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to me, came again to me, saying, Now, son of man, not Jesus, Ezekiel, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre and say to Tyre, you who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on many coastlands, thus says the Lord God. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 27 and 32. In their wailing for you, they will take up a lamentation and lament for you. What city is like Tyre? destroyed in the midst of the sea. So like I said, the sea is very important when we're dealing with Tyre. And we see the phrase, I am perfect in beauty. Who said that? Oh, Tyre, you have said. So if Tyre is already being spoken of in Ezekiel 27, then what is the context of Ezekiel 28? Well, let's find out. Yet you are a man and not a God. Ezekiel 28, 1 through 5. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you with your wisdom and your understanding you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries by your great wisdom in trade you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches so this prince of Tyre whose heart is lifted up because of his money and his beauty not his specific beauty to, as a man, but the beauty of his country that's in the midst of the seas. He's rich. He's wiser than Daniel. But his pride has got to him and he's think, he thinks he is a god. Right? And it clearly says you are a man and not a god. It doesn't say you are an angel. You are a fallen angel. You are Satan, Satan. None of that. You're a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. <laughs> right? So it's saying you might think you somebody, but you're really not that hot. Right? So we got some context of what's really going on from Ezekiel 27 all the way through 28, and it's still talking about the king of Tyre in the midst of the seas, and he's a man. Let's continue. I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings. So Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was called the king of kings. So the king of Tyre was not the king of kings, but Nebuchadnezzar was. Ezekiel 28, 6 through 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. 
and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. It doesn't say anything about going into a lake of fire or being in prison for a thousand years. Teddy's going to die in the midst of the sea. And they're going to come at him with swords. I mean, if this is an angel, Satan, the devil, what's a sword going to do to him? If he's a spirit, right? Ezekiel 26 and 7. Yep. Ezekiel 26. So we done went from Ezekiel 28. We done backed it up to 26. And guess who is still talking about? Tyre. Ezekiel 26 and 7. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses, with chariots and with horsemen and an army with many people. Doesn't say an angel's going to come and bind him and throw him in the lake of fire or put him in a bottomless pit. An army with just a regular king, Nebuchadnezzar. What's going to happen? Ezekiel 29 and 18. So we don't, we're, we're going to go all the way from Ezekiel 26 all the way through 29. And what is the context? A person, a man, a king of Tyre. Ezekiel 29, 18, son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyre. Every head was made bald and every shoulder rubbed raw, yet neither he or, nor his army received wages from Tyre for the labor which they expended on. So it was a, a, a battle. Don't say anybody grabbed him and threw him in the bottom of his pit, though. Oh, but Ezekiel 28 and 8 says they shall throw you down into the pit. Now, what does that mean? We're going to see this language and we're going to talk about a little bit how the pit is used in reference to punishing not only this king, but others as well. So are these other kings that go into the pit also Satan? Well, let's find out. Kings of Babylon and kings of Tyre, Isaiah 14 and 4, that you take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. The golden city. So we see Tyre was a crowning city, Babylon was a golden city, and it ceased, right? They both got problems coming to them. Isaiah 14 and 12, very famous verse. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. <clears throat> I'm actually doing a lesson on Isaiah 14 and 12 right after this lesson. So we're going to get into that. Who was Lucifer? What is Lucifer? So to stay in context, Ezekiel 26 and 17, they will take up a lamentation for you and say to you how you have perished. O one inhabited by sea faring men. How you have perished. O one inhabited by seafaring men, not angels, not demons. O renowned city. It was described as a crowning city. Now it's called a renowned city who was strong at sea. She and her inhabitants who caused their terry to be on all her inhabitants. <clears throat> on a side note. I don't know how many people talk about this, but I came across it. Um, and it could be a stretch, but it's, it, the way it's described is kind of how Atlantis is described. Some people say it was in the water. Some people say it was in different places that have something to do with some water. But 
it was a great city who was in the ocean or in some water or around some water, had wise people, and then the sea covered them up and destroyed them. So, like I said, could be a stretch. Just kind of interesting how they kind of have the same, you know, details. But Ezekiel 28 and 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. We ain't got to Ezekiel 28, 14, but Ezekiel 28 and 12 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Didn't we read earlier that the king of Tyre was wiser than Daniel and he said, I am perfect in beauty? Because of his glorious crowning city, his renowned city. We are we read that. So we got some context of all the props that the king of Tyre has. Full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He's a merchant, a trader, as in trading of goods. And he has to fight against the king of Babylon. Now, it's interesting. Isaiah 14, 12 is also referring to the king of Babylon. Because it tells you right here in Isaiah 14, 4, take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. So this is the proverbial uh, discourse describing the king of Babylon. It's a, pro it's a proverb. It's not telling you that he's actually a son of the morning and, or that he actually fell from heaven. And I, I'm going to go into that in, uh, when I talk about Isaiah 14, 12. But so far, we see from Ezekiel 26 all the way to Ezekiel 28 and 12, two verses before the famous verse about is this Satan or the king of Tyre, we see the king of Tyre being perfect in beauty and wisdom, and he's rich, and he's a merchant, and he has to fight the king of Babylon. He has a glorious city, so let's see what happens. But you shall be a man and not a god, Ezekiel 28, 9-10. Will you say before him who slays you? I am a God, but you shall be a man and not a God. Not a God. Because <clears throat> I, I thought in the New Testament, Satan or the devil is called the God of this world. But right here it tells you he's not a God. This king of Tyre. We're not talking about Satan. Satan is not mentioned in Ezekiel 28, but the king of Tyre is over and over. <clears throat> so let's, let's do this again. Ezekiel 28, 9 through 10. Will you say before him who slays you, I am a God, but you shall be a man and not a God. In the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Now, we know that word aliens is talking about strangers. Let's not get too sci-fi with it. But you should die. Nothing about going into the pit or being locked up for a thousand years. Nope. You should be a man and not a God. And a person is going to kill him. Now, I'm... Um, according to the New Testament, Jesus is supposed to crush the head of the serpent, which would be the devil to the Christians, right? Or Satan, right? That's what Jesus was supposed to do. But will you say before him who slays you? Way back in the book of Ezekiel, Satan dies? How did we do all that stuff in the New Testament? So is he a man? Is he a spirit? Or is he just not in Ezekiel to begin with? 
Now, I'm not saying that all Christians teach this, but a lot do. A lot do. So we we just got to clear this up. So let's continue. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Oh, Davon, didn't you just say that he was not in the garden of Eden in Genesis? <laughs> so let's read this. Ezekiel 28. 11 through 13. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, not the serpent in the garden, the king of Tyre, and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection for full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So over and over again, through from Ezekiel 26, through Ezekiel 28. We ain't got to verse 14 yet, but we keep seeing this king of Tyre full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, sardius topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created now what does all that even mean was this really talking about the garden of eden is why he saw these precious stones and diamonds and turquoise and onyx and jasper or is this a lamentation which is proverbial what does it mean to be in the garden of god does that mean literally there or just saying you were in a beautiful place let's see just as i saw ephraim like tyre planted in a pleasant place hosea 9 13 just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, so Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderer. So, was Ephraim in the garden of God? No, they were in Israel. They was given their inheritance in Israel. And remember, Adam and Eve were banished from the garden of Eden, and it was guarded by a sword and two cherubs. It was guarded by cherubs. So is Satan <laughs> the cherub that guarded the Garden of Eden? Is that what happened? Is that why it says you were in the Garden of God and he rebelled? So is he a fallen angel or was he a cherub? Which one? You see how it's just that there's no consistency with the story trying to, you know, make Satan wear all these hats. Nor does it tell us that, you know, Satan rebelled as a cherub because if he did, why would the Most High put cherubs on the Ark of the Covenant? If that would represent Satan and put it in the Holy of Holies. Explain that one to me. Why would Solomon put a cherub in the temple if it would represent Satan who rebelled against the Most High from the Garden of Eden? That wouldn't make any sense. Although not everybody would see it all the time because it was in the temple or in the tent of meeting. But yet and still, why would he command these things to be made? Even though they faced each other, they didn't face out so people could actually see their face and stuff like that. But yet and still, if Satan was a cherub who was in the Garden of Eden, who rebelled against the Most High, why would he be allowed to be having something made in his likeness to be in the whole? And the most I spoke from between the cherubs. 
Would that make any sense? No. So it says, just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, is basically saying you were in a good position, a beautiful place that was like the Garden of Eden. Not the literal garden because it was guarded by cherubs and a flaming sword. Read Genesis 3, 22 to 24. So let's continue. Say to Pharaoh, so now we have another king. We're going to see the same situation. King after king is given a proverbial saying against him. Because of his pride, he will be brought down. And we're going to see what it says about Pharaoh. Ezekiel 31, 1 through 3. Now it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third one, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom are you like in your greatness? Indeed, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with fine branches that shaded the forest and of high stature, and its top was among the thick boughs. So what does this have to do with the Garden of Eden? Let's see. All of the trees of Eden envied it. What are you talking about? What does that mean? Ezekiel 31 and 5. Therefore, its height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Its boughs were multiplied and its branches became long because of the abundance of water and it sent them out. Ezekiel 31, 8 through 9. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. The fir trees were not like its boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches, so all the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. So where was Pharaoh in the garden of Eden? Pharaoh wasn't there. There was no Pharaoh in the Garden of Eden. Right? So it's telling you a proverb that's comparing Pharaoh's greatness and his height and his beauty to the Garden of Eden. It just means you were in a good, you were sitting pretty, as we like to say. So all the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. These are not literal trees. This is the glory and the greatness of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He's not a literal tree. This language is throughout the Tanakh. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Remember that in Daniel chapter 4? Let's see what happened. Before we get to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we're going to continue in Ezekiel 31. Its heart was lifted up in its height. Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel 31, 10 through 14. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have increased in height and it set its top among the thick bowls and its heart was lifted up in its height. Therefore, I would deliver it into the hand of the mighty one of the nations and he shall surely deal with it. I have driven it out for its wickedness and aliens, the most terrible of the nations, have cut it down and left it. Its branches have fallen on the mountains and in all the valleys. Its bowls lie broken by all the rivers of the land and all the peoples of the earth have gone from under its shadow and left. Was Pharaoh really a tree? No. Ezekiel 31 and 13. On its ruin will remain all the birds of the heavens and all the beasts of the field will come to its branches so that no trees by the waters may ever again exalt themselves by their height, nor set their tops among the thick boughs that no tree which drinks water may ever be high enough to reach up to them. For they have all been delivered to death, to the depths of the earth, 
among the children of men who go down to the pit. Remember when it says this king will be thrown into the pit? Oh, that's got to be the devil. That's got to be Satan. Well, now we're talking about the king of Egypt. Same language. His heart was lifted up because of his glory, his height. He was chopped down. He was delivered to death, to the depths of the earth. Is that hell? Right? Figurative language. Among the children of men who go down to the pit. Doesn't say nothing about demons and devils and Satan. Among the children of men who go down to the pit. So we see the king of Tyre go down to the pit. And now we see the king of Fer the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, go down to the pit because of his height that was envied by the garden of God, which could not have been literal because the kingdom of Egypt was not there when the, before the garden of Eden was guarded to be envied in the first place. This is all figurative language. Let's continue. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Ezekiel 28, 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were, was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now, why are we talking about timbrels and pipes? Ezekiel 26 and 13, I will put an end to the sound of your songs and the sound of your harps shall be heard no more. We know how music brings joy and happiness and, and uh, people sing during times of prosperity. So, <clears throat> In Ezekiel 26 and 13, it says, I will put an end to the sound of your songs. So when Tyre was given this kingdom, they had everything. That's why they were called the traders and the merchants of the earth. They had access to all these stones. They had workmanship. They had the best of everything. That's why it's called the Garden of God, not literal Eden. But they was in a place to where they was exporting and importing all types of things. They were the Walmarts of the world back then, for lack of a better term. And they had music to make them happy as an expression. Remember, this is a lamentation against the king of Tyre. A lamentation. It's figurative language. That's why the sound of your songs will end and be heard no more. When they were set up, everything was fine, but it says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty and your wisdom. So you had all this and lost it because of your pride. That's why it says that the Most High hides pride from the sons of men. Yeah, it says that. Read the book of Job. He hides pride from the sons of men. Because look, look what you can lose. Look what you can lose. Here we go. The anointed cherub who covers. The anointed cherub who covers. Ezekiel 28, 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. What does this mean? Does this mean he was in heaven? Was the king of Tyre really Satan? And he's just called the king of Tyre. 
Why is it calling him a cherub who covers? Exodus 25 and 20. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above covering the mercy seat with their wings and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. First Kings 6 and 27. Then he set the cherubim inside the inner room and they stretched out the wings of the cherubim so the wing of the one touched one wall and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. So what do we see? We see that the cherubs cover. This is what they do. They have wings. They cover. Again, when it says you were the anointed cherub who covers, figurative, proverbial language, metaphoric language. Remember, it was called the crowning city, the renowned city. They covered like a tree, a tree in its branches that stretches out, like we saw the king of Pharaoh was compared to a tree who stretched out and covered everything. Everything took refuge under its tree, under its branches, which would cover everything. Okay. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Tyre was in a good position. Remember, I showed you that they were respected by David and Solomon. They were given a place in the earth where they were the merchants and the traders of everybody. They did business with so many people. They were crowning kings. They weren't the king of kings, that was Nebuchadnezzar. But they were in a good position and they lost it because of pride. Pride can be a, a, a terrible thing. Let's continue. Bestower of crowns. So like I said earlier in Isaiah 23 and eight, the American Standard Version says, he, he, <clears throat> who hath purposed this against Tyre? The bestower of crowns, whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers are the honorable of the earth. That's, this is why Tyre is called the, the, the anointed cherub who covers. Because they oversaw or they were this tree, this bow that covered all this merchandise who dealt with the traffickers who were the honorable of the earth. Basically, everybody came to them when they wanted some good stuff. All the good stuff, you go to Tyre. The <clears throat> CEB Bible says, who planned this covering? Who planned this concerning Tyre? The one who gives crowns. The one who gives crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honored of the earth. The CEV says, its merchants were kings honored all over the earth, all over the world. Who planned to destroy Tyre? The EHV says, who has planned this against Tyre, the city that crowned kings, whose merchants were like royal officials, whose traders were honored around the world? This is why Tyre was called the crowning city and the, the renowned city and the cherub who covers. They were in a position to deal with all the royalty of the earth through trading, through traffic. They was getting money. Everybody was getting money coming through Tyre because they had access to everything and they were in the midst of the seas. They wasn't just a little city. They was big time. Let's continue. 
Remember we talked about Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar being a tree? The tree grew branches. I'm sorry. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens. That would be a, a cherub who covers. That's covering some stuff, right? All the kingdoms who were big time are compared to trees who cover. Daniel 4, 10 through 12. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens. It could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beast of the field found shade, shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. So also, it doesn't exactly use the same language, but Nebuchadnezzar was a covering cherub or something that had oversight or covered the entire earth with its glory. Because remember, Tyre is also called a renowned city, a crowning city. And what does it say about Nebuchadnezzar? His tree reached to the heavens. The tree, the tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens. This is why <laughs> it says in Isaiah 14, you fell from heaven. Not because he was an angel who fell. It's because he was compared to a tree who reached the heavens. But we're going to talk about that when I do my lesson on Isaiah chapter 14. But we see Pharaoh, king of Egypt, compared to a tree. A great tall tree envied by the trees in the Garden of Eden. We see King of Babylon compared to a tree. So this is why Tyre is also called a covering cherub because we see the outstretched reach of a tall tree that reaches up to the heavens talking about a kingdom that has glory and power. That's all it's talking about. Let's continue. By the abundance of your trading, Ezekiel 28, 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Why did he sin? The abundance of your trading. Everybody was slanging, big time. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Literally, no, there would have been no violence in the mountain of God because nobody could get in the mountain of God if it was the Garden of Eden, literally, because it's covered by two cher or cherubim and it's covered by a flaming sword. So, therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you. Oh, covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. I destroyed you. Doesn't say nothing about you went into a pit for a thousand years and chained up by an angel. I destroyed you, oh, covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. 7404 in the Strongs. Rekula, merchandise traffic. Why am I talking about traffic? Because it says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. And you sinned. It doesn't say anything about being a devil or Satan or, you know, coming from the bottomless pit. No. By the abundance of your trading, which stretches all the way back to Ezekiel 26 in context, talking about who? Yep, the king of Tyre. Not Satan. Not a word. What were they doing? What were they doing? They bartered human lives. Ezekiel 27, 13. Javan, Tubal, and Meshach were your traitors. They bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. Ezekiel 27 and 14. Those from the house of Togarma 
traded for your wares with horses, steeds, and mules. Ezekiel 27, 15, the men of Dedan were your traders. Many isles were the market of your hand. They brought you ivory, tusks, and ebony as payment. They was bout they bread. They was about they bread, full of traders and merchandise. They were selling people, horses, anything you could think of probably. Tusks, ebony, ivory, right? And we in context, because we done went three chapters. Well, actually, we went from, yeah, Ezekiel 26 all the way to 29. Talking about who? The king of Tyre. Let's continue. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches. Ezekiel 27, 17. Judah and the land of Israel were your traders. They traded for your merchandise, wheat of minute, millet, honey, oil, and balm. Ezekiel 27, 21. Arabia. And all the princes of Kadar were your regular merchants. They traded with you in lambs, rams, and goats. Ezekiel 27, 22. The merchants of Sheba and Ramah were your merchants. They traded for your wares, the choicest spices, all kinds of precious stones and gold. That's why I said you were walking among all these precious stones because they was in your hand. They were trading all these things. This is why it talks about you were in the garden of God, because you had access to everything came through your hands. Ezekiel 28 and 5. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. So when did Satan need money? When did, when did he need some money? He's a he's a merchant now? He's a businessman? Come on. Doesn't it tell you that the, you know, in Eden, where the four rivers were, there was onyx stones and, you know, the choice is gold. That's why all this language is talking about. That's why it compares Tyre to the Garden of God, because they had access to every Thing, all the good stuff, all the kings of the earth came through there. This wasn't 7 Eleven. This was a merchant mart. This was big time. Let's continue. So let's let's set a tone here. <clears throat> if if something keeps being mentioned in context about the same person over and over again. How, how does all of a sudden one verse describe Satan, but the rest of the verses in context are talking about the king of Tyre? Ezekiel 27, 3. And say to Tyre, you who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on many coastlands, thus says the Lord God. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Ezekiel 27, 4. Your borders are in the midst of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. Ezekiel 27, 11. Men of Arvad with your army were on your walls all around, and the men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They made your beauty perfect. They made your beauty perfect. So we see perfect in beauty Three times already before we even get to Ezekiel 28. Let's, let's continue. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Ezekiel 28, 7. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defy your splendor. Ezekiel 28 and 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. So we, we're dropping names here. In context, and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So if all this leading up 
to Ezekiel 28, 14. It's talking about the king of Tyre and his wisdom and his beauty and his merchandise and his riches and his pride and how he covered the earth as a tree, proverbial, as a proverb. Um, wouldn't it stand the reason that Ezekiel 28, 14 is still talking about this king of Tyre? Your corrupted wisdom. Your corrupted wisdom. Ezekiel 28, 17. Your heart was lifted up because of what? Your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. He got laid before kings because he was surrounded by the kings. It was the crowning city. This was the crowning city. That's why he was laid before kings. So let's back it up a little bit. Again, Ezekiel 28, 3 through 7. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. Daniel, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you gain riches for yourself and gather gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Doesn't say anything about trying to overthrow God. Now, it says he, his heart was like a God, but it doesn't say anything about rebelling against God and heaven and all the stuff you're going to hear from a pastor. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. So back to Ezekiel 28, 12. Who is this talking about? Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So all through Ezekiel, from 26 through 28, actually through 29, but right here through 28 so far, we didn't even went past Ezekiel 28, 14 and jump to verse 17. Ezekiel 28, 17 is talking about the same scenario of your heart being lifted up because of your beauty and your wisdom. And you laid before kings, all of these kings you were doing business with. So unless the kings of the earth were doing business with Satan, we we missing a whole story here that nobody wants to talk about. When when did the king of the kings of the earth tell you that the days to go and hang and slang with Satan? No. And if if if, if Hiram was doing business with with David and he was a king of Tyre. I mean, is Hiram like the grandfather of Satan or something? Or like, how does Satan become the king of Tyre? Even personified. Because he got, was evil. So everybody evil is, is devil, the devil now, is Satan now? No. That's not what we're reading here in context. We're reading about a king who was rich and he let his heart get full of pride and he tricked everything off. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. So, this is not talking about being thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. This is not talking about somebody who came out of a pit after a thousand years. This is talking about somebody who was a king on earth, who was a traitor, who dealt with the kings of the earth and was eventually destroyed because of his pride, of his beauty, of his surroundings, of his country, and the wisdom that he had is why he was able to accumulate so much wealth. So. Ezekiel 28, 18 through 19. 
you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. So the multitude of your iniquities came from trading, not from trying to rebel against God or be uh, a, a fallen angel or take over the throne of God. No, it says by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. All who knew you. Does everybody like know Satan like that? To where they're like, wow, you know, you have become a horror and shall be no more forever. This is way back in Ezekiel. You know when Ezekiel lived? Ezekiel lived before the uh, return of uh Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple. Ezekiel was among the exiles of the first temple. So if he was if he's talking about Tyre, now that this doesn't that doesn't have to mean that when Ezekiel was alive, this pro prophecy had to play out at that specific time. But it did have to play out in the time frame that the king of Babylon would destroy it. And Ezekiel lived during the time of the king of Babylon. So, just to put in the context of time frames. So we know that the, the kingdom of Babylon ended with the Medes and the Persians. Right? And we know the Medes and the Persians are the ones that gave Israel the ability to return from the captivity of Babylon because Babylon was destroyed. So if you go back to Daniel chapter five, it tells you that, that they lost their throne, they lost their kingdom. And it have to be after, had to have been after 70 years that Nebuchadnezzar was told that he was gonna be this king, him and his son's son because it says you will serve him and his son's son for 70 years. So, again, Ezekiel 28, 18 through 19, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Their iniquity was their trading. This is what they were doing. This is what got them into trouble. Or this specific king or this country, however you want to word that, because we know kings represent their countries. Excuse me. So it says, therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth and the sight of all who saw you. So we're going to build upon this fire from your midst. Right. What does that actually mean? Wise, beautiful and destroyed by fire. Zechariah 9, 1 through 4. The burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach and Damascus, its resting place for the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. Also against Hamath, which borders on it and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. For Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust and gold like the mire of the streets. Still talking about Tyre being wise and rich and heaping up gold. That's why they were able to beautify their city. Behold, the Lord will cast her out and he will destroy her power in the sea and she will be devoured by fire. That's how he brought fire from the midst because they were sieged. They were destroyed. Her power in the sea. We see the whole concept of them being the uh the border in the sea and their kingdom being around the sea all the way back in ezekiel from 26 all the way through 28 it's talking about tyre's power of the sea and it being a merchant and beautiful and wise carried into the book of zechariah the context is there not a word about satan a fire upon the wall of tyre amos 1 and 10 
but I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which shall devour its palaces. Same concept in Ezekiel 28 and 18. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst and devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. So we even see in Amos that he was going to send fire upon the wall of Tyre. Conclusion. Not a single word about Satan or the lake of fire or being in a pit for a thousand years or a dragon, etc. The king of Tyre is clearly spoken of poetically to convey the message of his pride, wisdom and beauty destroyed him. And his glorious city, just as it did with the kings of Babylon, the kings of Egypt, the kings of Assyria and the kings of Israel. No discrimination. Zechariah 10 and 11. He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up. Then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. So we see the arrogance of the king of Egypt and the king of Assyria. There's problems with that pride. Second Chronicles 26, 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. This is when one of the kings, <laughs> one of the kings, one of the kings, one of the priests of Melchizedek, somebody from the order of Melchizedek, which just means an order of righteous kings. I have a whole lesson on it. Psalm 110 and the Kings of Righteousness. I have a book on it. Psalm 110 and the King of Righteousness available at Amazon.com. We see here one of the kings of Israel was able <clears throat> to destroy himself. Not able, but he... He, I mean, he was able, but he destroyed himself because he entered the temple to burn incense. That was for who? The priest to do. Although he was a priest from the order of Melchizedek, this specific job was only for the Levites. So the order of Melchizedek does not trump the Levitical priesthood. But <clears throat> not to get too deep into that, but we see a clear verse. His heart was lifted up to his destruction because he thought he could burn that incense that was only for the priests, which were Levites. Isaiah 13, 19, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So we see Babylon, like I said, Israel, Egypt, Assyria, all destroyed because of their pride. And they were all beautified in their kingdom and their glory. Same language when you read about the king of Assyria and, and his glory and the king of Egypt and his glory and the king of Babylon and his glory and the king of Tyre and their glory, Israel and their glory. That pride got them all caught up and destroyed. Not one word about Satan in Ezekiel 26 through 29, and especially Ezekiel 28, which is where most pastors are going to take you because they see the word cherub and they see the word in the garden of God. When you read it in context, it's clearly talking about a king who lost himself because of the merchandise that he oversaw and it didn't work out well so with that being said subscribe to the youtube channel clouds of torah hit up amazon grab some books the false fulfillment citation series share the video like the video i appreciate your time i appreciate you listening shalom